Commissioner Mignon Clyburn is currently serving a second term as a Democrat on the Federal Communications Commission, FCC. Clyburn began her service at the FCC in August 2009 after spending 11 years as a member of the 6th District on the Public Service Commission of South Carolina. A longtime champion of consumers and a defender of the public interest, please welcome to the stage Commissioner Mignon Clyburn. Thank you very much, and, and how appropriate it is that they played uh, MJ on my way up. <laughs> uh, good morning again, and welcome. Uh, I am so incredibly honored to be welcomed uh, in a group of so many accomplished leaders and at a session with the expressed objective of enhancing opportunities for women. Now, whether you work in the media sector or rely on it to enhance your business, we cannot overstate how the industry informs, entertains, and character shapes our societies. Gloria Steinem once said, it is hard to think of anything except air, food, and water that is more important than the media. The media is the fourth estate. It is vital to our democracy. It informs citizens about actions of our government, and it holds our government accountable to the people. Equally important, the media is a powerful economic and cultural force molding and shaping our ideas, images, and our understanding of the world. What then is to be said about the state of affairs in the media today? While there has been much talk about media coverage during and after the recent presidential election, far less attention has been given to the state of diversity across the media landscape. The lack of diversity is reflected and who owns the major media companies, those who are in front as well as behind the cameras. Simply put, men dominate every single media platform from television to film to radio, newspapers, and online sources. So regardless of your point of view when it comes to politics, you should find these statistics disheartening. The Federal Communications Commission's most recent report on media ownership which was released just yesterday, so this is fresh off the press, revealed that women own just 8.6% of the 11,919 broadcast stations in this country. Did you hear me? 8.6%. According to the Women's Media Center 2017 report, 20 of the top news outlets, men produce 62.3% of the news reports. Women receive only 38% of the byline and other credits in print, internet, television, and wire news, and of the top 100 rated radio talk shows, only 13% are hosted by women. Of the top 250 top grossing domestic films last year, female directors, writers, producers, executive producers, editors, and cinematographers combined totaled 17%. Now, that's the same percentage that it was in 1998, almost 20 years ago, and there has been no movement, even though the movement has been with our percentage of the population at 51%. And further describing the media that never shy and often controversial, Steinem said, and I will paraphrase it in a way in which I grew up hearing, you cannot be what you cannot see. The presence or more appropriately for our conversation, the absence of women in media truly matters because credible stories show that women are more likely to hire women, create programming opportunities for women. For example, entertainment shows online and on television that have at least one female executive producer, they have more female characters. What a surprise there. So if we want our media landscape to reflect this nation's rich diversity, it only makes sense that women must have equal opportunities to be in the decision-making roles. Yet with all of the progress some might say we've made, women continue to face challenges when it comes to entering the media industry. Just over 20 years ago, Congress enacted this landmark legislation 
called the 1996 Telecommunications uh, Act. And in doing so, many ownership restrictions, which had previously been in place to prevent a single company from owning broadcast stations in multiple markets, they were eliminated. Take, for example, a rule that previously prevented one company from owning more than 40 radio stations. Today, there is one company that owns 850 radio stations, and this is more than 20 times larger than the limits that were set before that act was passed 20 years ago. Now, across the board, deregulation and other actions since the act have been, has been, was passed have led to the increase in media consolidations, and for us, I'm sad to say, that means fewer opportunities. Women and minority media owners, it remains at a shockingly low level. And despite these disheartening statistics that I've already shared, there are many of us who are still advocating to, elim to, uh, advocating to eliminate um, rules that remain in place. We want to eliminate, there are people who want to eliminate the rules that remain in place. And, and when this happens, this will double down and ensure that ownership will remain in the hands of just a few large media conglomerates. And this, I, it pays me to say to you today, is the track that we are on right now. Now, access to capital, this won't surprise you, remains one of the greatest barriers facing women and minorities when it comes to media and other opportunities. It is extraordinarily expensive to to engage in this, uh, in, in this ecosystem. Launching a, a single radio, radio station, it has been estimated, can cost you around $10 million. Similarly, with some analysis uh, that the FCC produced, if you were to be interested in a single television station, that would cost you around $20 uh, million. Now, these figures don't take into account infrastructure, salaries, and other costs that you will incur when it comes to launching and maintaining a, a broadcast station. So it's very difficult to engage in this space. But while the lack of the uh, diversity is glaring in the media, what we rarely hear is solutions. Nobody is really talking about the solutions. We concentrate on the problems, and I think there's a problem uh, with that. So I wanted to lay out a couple of things that I think could move the needle when it comes to that. Several years ago, there was something called a tax certificate program. And during its 17 years of existence, this FCC-run program successfully helped to bring the highest number of diverse entrepreneurs on record into the broadcast industry. Specifically, what it did was allow for the seller of a broadcast station or cable property or who had an interest in that property to defer payment from federal income taxes under certain conditions if that property were sold to an underrepresented uh, purchaser. And according to Dr. Jeffrey Blevins of the University of Cincinnati, prior, prior to this policy, minority owns, minorities own just 40 of the 8,500 US radio and television stations. But during the existence of, the, of this policy, Minorities and women acquired 288 radio stations and 43 television stations. And despite it ending in 1995, I am convinced that if we were to reinstate a tax certificate program, we will see those numbers moving in that direction. Also, we've been advocating something called an incubator program, which would be designed to expressly increase women and minority ownership. Now, one way to achieve this is by waiving certain ownership restrictions for an established broadcaster in a market in exchange for that established broadcaster incubating a woman-owned company. Such an incubation in the form of financial, programming, or technical support could result in successful entry into a new with a new broadcaster, increasing the diversity of voices and ownerships to the public. Even absent an explicit incubator program, I believe that you should ask the industry to support and nurture women-owned broadcast businesses because I think it's in all of our best interests. Now, since arriving at the FCC in 2009, I have heard countless stories about independent programmers who are struggling day-to-day -to, -day to remain viable. 
They try to strike deals, carriage deals, uh, with the larger uh, uh, broadcasters or, or providers or cable companies, and the calls are rarely returned. They are faced with a number of barriers in terms of carriage, in terms of programming, and contracts that really limit uh, their ability uh, to thrive, and that is a problem. So it cl it's clear to me that in order to change the paradigm, we must adopt different types of rules that will ensure for a sustainable future for independent programmers, for women who want to own stations. The FCC has a, the ability to level the playing field for independent programmers and those who are interested uh, in the media market, and I believe we need to concentrate and ask your commissioners uh, to do so. Now, the FCC also has an Office of Communications Business Opportunities, which was established back in 1995 with the express mission to recommend policies, programming, programs, and practices that promote participation by small entities, women, and minorities in the communications space. We have hosted small business and emerging technologies fairs, supplier diversity conferences and workshops, government advertising roundtables, and countless other events that are aimed at seeking to enter or continue working and increase the numbers in the communications sector. These are open to the public, and when we have them, I think you should participate. And finally, while this is not in the direct scope of the FCC, I am personally passionate about increasing the representation of women in the technology sector. According to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's Diversity and High Tech Report, women represent 36% of the tech hires compared to 48% in other industries. Now, I saw this firsthand when I visited S Silicon Valley last summer. So in October, the, the EEOC announced the launch of a working group that is aimed at improving both gender and racial diversity at tech companies. Identifying solutions require us to first-hand acknowledge that we have a problem. We have to accumulate the facts. So I am pleased that many of the nation's leading tech companies have finally begun to pro uh, uh, process this and have published and are publishing their annual data on employee diversity. Now it's time for the EEOC and the rest of us working with Congress and other leaders to establish a series of best practices that will encourage those tech companies to increase the hiring of women. And now it is time for us to speak out and demand for everyone to do so. While the FCC and its work might not be the topic of your every night dinner conversation, the role in which we play as defenders of the public interest is vital for a vibrant e democracy. So I am grateful for the opportunity to be here, and I am hope that this will launch a series of conversations between me, you, the FCC, and others interested in the communication space on how we can use public policy and other private sector opportunities to enhance opportunities for women in the communication space and beyond. I thank you, and let's work together to make a difference.